2023 has really turned out to be the year of the SUV for Honda. We have a new Pilot coming soon, we have the new CRV, and of course the new third generation Honda HRV. All three of these vehicles have become a bit more grown up, a bit classier, and a bit more refined in this generation. And for the HRV, that's good and bad. It also makes the HRV a little bit less exciting and in many ways a bit less practical versus the previous generation. Let's take a deep, deep dive into this HRV and explain why you might want one or why you might want something else. If you're watching this video outside of North America, you might be thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, that's not a Honda HRV and you would technically be correct in your market, although it is sold as one here in the US. Here's what's going on. For 2023, Honda decided to create two completely different vehicles. The 2023 HRV for North America, also sold as the ZRV around the world, and then of course the European market HRV also sold as the Vezel here and there. In some markets, both vehicles will coexist, which is why the ZRV name was created. This generation HRV was designed primarily for North America, whereas the other HRV was designed primarily for Japan and the European market. China is interestingly going to be getting this bigger model as well because the general design of this seems to fit Chinese tastes and American tastes a bit better. This is certainly bigger, a little bit bigger feeling, bigger driving out on the road, and in some ways a little bit less exciting than that HRV slash Vezel. But on the other hand, I think this HRV is exactly what a lot of shoppers in America were looking for. The subcompact crossover segment is arguably the hottest in North America right now. Over the last few years, sales and the number of options have absolutely exploded. Generally speaking, subcompact crossovers in this country range from around $20,000 to $30,000 as long as we're not talking about the luxury alternatives. This HRV is on the upper end of that pricing ladder, running from just under $25,000 to just over $30,000 when fully equipped, as is the model that we're taking a look at today. I think the design is relatively fitting with that upper end pricing ladder, although I have to admit the front end does come across as a little boring to me. Also, a little bit more Ford in the design language than Honda, I have to admit. We have full LED headlights up front, but oddly, no fog lights down below. There's definitely a decent amount of cheese grater going on right there, and the overall design is definitely more blunt and more upright than we've found in previous generations of the HRV. As you move around to the side, you'll notice how radically different this generation HRV is. First thing you'll notice is the size. It is 179.8 inches long, nearly 10 inches longer than the outgoing model. It's the longest in the segment and nearly as long as a CX-5. So subcompact crossover probably ought to be in air quotes when we're talking about the HRV. The form of the vehicle has also changed. You'll notice that longer hood profile up front. It really gives this kind of a station wagon-y vibe. We have kind of a narrower greenhouse than we had before, slightly higher belt line, but importantly, the roof line is a little bit higher than the outgoing HRV. So even though this looks sleeker and lower to the ground, it's actually a little bit higher. Adding to the sort of Subaru Outback vibe that sometimes I'm getting from the HRV, we have more of a sloped rear hatch here, and the seating position is definitely more reclined than we found in the previous HRV. Sometimes auto manufacturers go in different directions with their products, even when they're redesigning them at the same time, and the HRV and Pilot are good examples. This certainly doesn't have the boxy, ruggedy looks that we find in the Pilot, but oddly enough, it has things that we don't find in the Pilot, like full LED taillight modules, including the amber turn signal. I have no idea why we get full LEDs here, and then not full LEDs in the much more expensive Pilot. But I have to say, they really dress up the back of the HRV, and they certainly make it feel more premium, something that Mazda has really done well in their vehicles as well. They often have full LEDs all the way around the vehicle, and it really does give vehicles like this and the smaller Mazdas more of a premium feel versus something like a Corolla Cross, which definitely has sort of cheap cheesy feeling tail lamps in the back. As we see in the rest of Honda's lineup, they're a bit more aggressive at bundling active safety tech on every version of the HRV than some of the key competitors in this segment. You'll find autonomous emergency braking, road departure mitigation, adaptive cruise control, auto high beams, lane keeping, and the traffic jam assist standard on every version of the HRV. Optional is the blind spot monitoring system. You'll find that on the EXL trim and above. I wish that was standard on the base version and low speed braking assist. That's only on the top end trim that I'm driving. Also found only in the top trim are front and rear parking sensors. The backup camera is of course standard, but I wish the parking sensors were available on other trims of the HRV because they certainly make city parking maneuvers a lot easier. A lot of folks were hoping that this generation HRV would gain a hybrid system to help it better compete with the Corolla Cross Hybrid. 
Well, outside the US it does, but here we just have Honda's trusty two liter four cylinder naturally aspirated engine. This produces 158 horsepower and 138 pound feet of torque. That's definitely a bump over the previous generation. It's still mated to a continuously variable automatic transmission and you can choose between front wheel drive or all wheel drive. But fuel economy is a little bit lower than the outgoing model. 27 miles per gallon when equipped with all wheel drive like I'm testing, 28 if you choose the front wheel drive model. That's primarily because we have slightly higher ground clearance in the front wheel drive models than we had before, and this is notably heavier than the outgoing model, between 180 and about 250 pounds heavier than the outgoing HRV. That's thanks to the larger dimensions, of course, and likely the fact that this is now based on that larger Honda platform. Power figures are pretty similar to most of the competition, but you will find more powerful and more fuel efficient options in this segment. After a week of driving, I'm going to give this seat 7 out of 10 points. In this top end trim, the driver's seat is powered. The bottom cushion is a little bit short for my tastes, and there's no adjustable lumbar support, but fortunately, I bring my own in such cases, and that does make the seat a lot more comfortable. I really wish in this upper end trim we had at least manual adjustability for that lumbar support. That would be a nice touch. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a reasonable amount of motion, but I do find more range of motion in some of the competition. It's worth noting that as in most of the options in this segment, the passenger seat is manual and it's not as adjustable as the driver's seat. Headroom is pretty generous because of the new seating position. You'll certainly notice that this is much more of a sedan or hatchback like seating position inside than the previous generation HRV, which was quite upright. The result of that is that I have lots of headroom here up front. This has the optional power moonroof, and I still have about two inches of headroom left, but you definitely get a different feeling in here. You can really see that long hood stretching out in front of you, and it certainly feels like you're lower in the vehicle. Before I talk about the back seat itself, I should probably explain how legroom is measured. It's sort of a two-piece measurement. There's one measurement from the seat back cushion to a theoretical knee location, and then from that knee location down at an angle towards the floor. The result of this is that you could have two vehicles with very different seating positions, but the same legroom number. So you could have one car where you're really stretched out with your legs way out in front of you, or you could have a vehicle where you're very upright, practically right up on the front seat back, and you could still get the same sort of legroom number as long as you're high enough off the ground. That's sort of the difference between this HRV and the previous generation HRV. This is much more relaxed and reclined, and you will certainly notice it when I'm sitting back here. That front footwell is quite a long way away, and the seat bottom back here is a little bit closer to the floor than it was before. Kids are likely going to be happier with that because their legs aren't going to be dangling in the air, but adults are going to find a definite lack of thigh support back here. And depending on how you want to sit up front, you could get more or less legroom in the back versus that previous generation HRV. The floor is almost completely flat, even though this is the all wheel drive model, so that really makes it a lot easier for someone to sit back here in the middle. It's worth noting that this is wider than average for a subcompact crossover in the US, so it's much more likely that you're going to be able to squeeze three people back here or put a child seat in the middle and then someone on either side versus some of the really small options in this segment. The rear seats fold in a 60-40 fashion. There is a lever right over there, but we no longer have the magic seat that the HRV and the Fit were known for. That particular feature appears to be incompatible with the HRV because of where the gas tank is located, and it does compromise that space that we formerly found underneath the rear seats. The former HRV was an engineering marvel when it came to packaging efficiency, or the amount of space you get on the inside versus the size of the vehicle on the outside. This HRV is more average. We get 24.4 cubic feet of storage space back here, definitely high for the subcompact segment, but that's only marginally better than the outgoing model, even though, again, this is a full nine point something inches longer. Some folks might be disappointed by that, but I don't think it's a problem because this is a pretty big cargo area. And as you can see, if I fold down the rear seats, they fold almost completely flat with the cargo area in the rear. Then I can lift up this load floor. It does feel a little flimsy and I find some additional storage space with this big foam divider. I do wish this area was a bit more efficiently used. And then under that, we have a temporary spare tire. Personally, I would love to have seen Honda incorporate the jack and other things in an insert in the spare tire and then give us a two-stage load floor like we find in some of the competition, but as it is, this is still a very large and accommodating cargo area. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end trim, so obviously there are things in here you won't find in the base model, like the power moonroof. One thing I didn't expect to see in the ceiling are these, I guess you'd say, airline-style LED reading lights for the back seats. Those are really an elegant touch. From this angle, you can see those rear seats folded almost flat with the cargo area in the back. We have height adjustable shoulder belts and height adjustable headrests for the front passenger. 
As you'd expect out of a top trim, we have leather upholstery in here. Moving over to the front doors, we have a soft touch armrest with kind of an hourglass style shape going on there. Below that, we have bottle holders in the door, and you can see the sort of wavy texture going on on that hard plastic lower door panel. That's to enable the door to be a little bit lighter, give it some extra structure, but also kind of a different feel. We also have hard plastics, just as you'd expect in an inexpensive vehicle, like this entire midsection of the door, and then soft plastics right on top of that. Moving over to the dashboard, we find the latest Honda design language applied to the HRV. The design of the cheese grater section is essentially the same as the Civic and a little bit different than we find in the upcoming Honda Accord. I have the same concern with this as I do in the Civic and the Accord, and that is it's kind of difficult to clean behind there, especially if you live in a dustier area. You can blow it out, but that's about all you can do. On this side, we have a pretty decently sized glove compartment. I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside, and then we have soft touch materials around the dashboard. They're actually stitched. You can see the stitching right over there on the passenger side. We also get some stitching on the other side of that center dashboard piece. You can see the engine start stop button there and then the air vent. You can see that the veins are completely under that cheese grater section. You open and close it and direct it around with that little tab. Moving out from there, we find one of two different infotainment systems. It supports wireless CarPlay in this top end trim. The other models are going to get a smaller 7 inch display but positioned in the same location in the dashboard. I appreciate that Honda still gives us some physical buttons on the left side of the screen. Home, back, a physical volume knob and track forward button here but the graphics don't feel quite as modern as some of the competition. Moving further down the dashboard, we find the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control. Single zone is standard, dual zone is optional, and we have the buttons for the heated seats right over there. We have a wireless charging mat in this trim, the USB interface for that infotainment system, two pretty big cup holders right there, and then a console shifter. The hourglass theme from the doors is replicated right here in the center console where we have a drive mode selector, hill descent control, electric parking brake, auto brake hold, and then a storage area that actually goes right there. Under that section, you'll find a USB charge only port on that side and thoughtfully another one over there on the passenger side. Going back to the shifter for just a moment, you'll notice we have sport and low, so basically low and lower for the transmission. Moving back there, we have a padded center armrest with a surprisingly large amount of storage area, something that the HRV has always been known for is storage practicality, and that does appear to continue at least in this area of the vehicle. On the driver's side, we find a standard partial LCD cluster. So on the left side of things, we have a seven inch LCD. Then we have a physical speedometer to the right of that. The steering wheel should be very familiar if you've been inside any recent Honda. The only difference between this and some is that we don't have any paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel. We have infotainment controls on the left side, along with this home and roller control that control that multifunction LCD, and then the controls for the adaptive cruise control and lane centering system on the right side. Now it's time to get the HRV out on the road. First, let's talk acceleration. Zero to 60 times in this vehicle are going to be the best when you put it in L mode, the transmission selector, because it's just going to hang out at a high RPM as you accelerate and that is gonna get this zero to 60 in about 9.3 seconds. I was able to do just one run in 9.2. Now, most of the time it's gonna be around 9.4, 9.5, because if I put this in drive, just to give you an idea of the difference, this is going to imitate shifts. And personally, I blame a lot of auto journalists for this because a lot of people complain about the way CVTs feel, so Honda and a number of other car companies have decided that these need to imitate shifts, like you just heard there. Now, the downside to that is that it actually goes slower zero to 60, and then the shifts feel a little bit funny because it's never really gonna feel like a traditional automatic. And in many ways, that ultimately makes a CVT programmed to do that sort of the worst of both worlds. It's not gonna feel quite like a regular automatic. It's not gonna get you as quick zero to 60 as a regular CVT, and you're likely gonna give up a little bit of efficiency because of that. Now, in regular driving, it is just gonna sit there and vary the ratio, so more sedate driving like this, if I press a little deeper on the accelerator pedal, it's not gonna have anything like an imitation shift. But if I stab the accelerator pedal, it's definitely gonna have that imitation shift there. As far as the competition goes, acceleration here is right in line with the Corolla Cross, but then there is that Corolla Cross Hybrid. With the Subaru Crosstrek, currently the best seller in this segment, the base engine's gonna be right around this kind of zero to 60, but you will go about two seconds faster in the optional two and a half liter engine, which is available there, and we don't have any more powerful engine available here. I am kind of surprised that Honda didn't give this perhaps an optional one and a half liter turbo. That really would be an interesting twist in this particular segment. As far as braking distances go, I scored 125 feet from 60 miles an hour to zero, putting this right in line with most of the competition, but a little bit longer than the previous generation, likely thanks to the added curb weight. 
The added curb weight and the softer tune to the suspension and the larger vehicle dimensions certainly mean this doesn't feel quite as enthusiastic out on the road, shall we say, as the previous generation model. It's also not really any faster zero to 60. The last front wheel drive one that I tested was nine and a half seconds zero to 60, so only a hair slower than this model. And that's again because even though we have more power and a better torque curve, we have that extra curb weight to contend with. And of course, the all-wheel drive model is going to be the slowest. Now, as far as handling goes, this is not going to grip the road as well as the Subaru or the Toyota or the Hyundai or the Kia competition. But it does have a very different feel because of the larger dimensions. It feels more grown up, more stable, more planted than those numbers would otherwise indicate. And I think that I like the feel a little bit better than those other options. It feels bigger and more grown up. Of course, not everybody is interested in their small crossover feeling like a bigger crossover on the road. But if that's what you're into, then you're going to find that here. And it is going to be more solid, more composed, and really just feel better put together than most of the competition. I will say, however, that the Corolla Cross is pretty similar to this in terms of its refinement. The grown-up theme continues out on a rougher road surface like the one that I'm on here. I'm going to give the ride quality an A because this certainly feels more composed and more grown-up than the average in this segment. That shouldn't surprise too much because of the dimensions of the HRV. The longer wheelbase versus a lot of the competition means that the front suspension and rear suspension have time to settle before the other suspension impacts the same bump. We also have a bit more curb weight, which helps give this a bit more of a heftier feel out on roads like this as well. This particular model is 3,333 pounds, according to Honda. That's about 400 pounds heavier than the Honda Civic with the same engine, because this, of course, has all-wheel drive, and the structure of a crossover is just a little bit heavier and a little bit different than the sedan. Back out on the paved road, I measured 73 decibels at 50 miles an hour, putting this a little bit behind the average for this segment in terms of its cabin quietness. That's something that Honda has struggled with for a while in some of their inexpensive vehicles, and it does seem to continue here in the HRV. We're especially getting a lot of road noise from the back of the vehicle. Road noise up front is really well controlled, as is wind noise, but I'm certainly getting a lot of noise from back there. And you'll also notice if I uh, put this in the L mode and floor it again, you also get a reasonable amount of exhaust noise, interestingly enough, from the cargo area, especially if the rear seats are folded. With a week of mixed driving under this vehicle's belt, it has been averaging slightly above the EPA number. I've been averaging 27 and a half miles per gallon. This all wheel drive version is theoretically rated for 27, but that is still lower than a lot of the competition, especially if you take a look at the hybrid and plug-in hybrid competitors, which are available here. So the Corolla Cross hybrid has really excellent fuel economy, but you will also get excellent fuel economy in the Subaru even though all-wheel drive is standard on that model. Really, the Crosstrek is one of the few no-compromises all-wheel drive vehicles in this segment. It doesn't really cost any more than the front-wheel drive version of this, and the fuel economy is actually going to be a little bit better than the front-wheel drive version of this. On the other hand, the previous generation of the Crosstrek certainly came across as less refined than this, and I don't like the way that Subaru's CVT shifts. I haven't driven the new Crosstrek. There is a brand new one out. I will be driving that very soon. There's also going to be a brand new five-door Impreza, so be sure and stay tuned for those videos. The one thing that Subaru has not said is whether a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid Crosstrek will return for this next generation. I wouldn't be surprised if they did because it is the best seller currently. But even if it doesn't, we still have that Corolla Cross hybrid, and of course we have the better fuel economy in the regular Subaru. As far as fuel economy goes, I'm going to have to give the HRV a B-, because there are other high efficiency options in this segment. Whether you want to take a look at a Corolla Cross hybrid, or just the regular non-hybrid version of the Crosstrek, or whether you'd consider something like a Kia Niro in this segment, you'll get about 50 mpg out of that. That is certainly significantly better than this, but all-wheel drive is not available. Bottom lining the HRV out on the road is pretty easy. This has certainly become more comfortable, the suspension has become more compliant, better tuned, more refined, etc. But in the process, it has given up a bit of handling, and it's certainly given up a lot of acceleration to some of the competition. I also wish that Honda would spend just a little bit more time on sound deadening. That really would work with the rest of the theme in the HRV. If the HRV was the quietest in this segment, I think I could forgive a lot of the other things. But bear in mind that you will find quieter cabins in some of the competition, better fuel economy in some of the competition, and yes, faster acceleration as well. 
Now it's time to talk about how the HRV scores. I love the design of the HRV. I do like the more grown-up aesthetic, but I have to say that it has lost magic as a result of its grown-up design. Because this is now based on the Civic, we lose the magic seats, and the interior is simply not as pragmatically arranged as the previous generation HRV. So the interior dimensions are pretty similar to the outgoing model, even though it is significantly larger on the outside. That is really going to be a disappointment to a lot of people that live in urban areas that really wanted a compact vehicle to park a little bit more easily on the street. So you're going to have that bigger vehicle, but not the bigger vehicle kind of room that you might assume. I also love the Civic quality parts on the inside, although some folks seem a little bit irritated that there is so much samey sameness going on with Honda's design language lately. Because we have that same Civic design language in this and, of course, in the CRV and in the new Accord as well, there is a common aspect that's a bit of a bummer, and that's the ease to clean behind that grate on the dashboard. After a week with these vehicles, and I've noticed this as well in the CRV, etc., a lot of dust ends up back there, and there's just no good way to get it out. You can use, you know, a can of compressed air or an air compressor to try and blow it out, but if the dust ends up sticking in there for too long, it's going to be a real bear to remove. Now, I do love the simple pricing scheme. We're going to talk about that in a bit. And the HRV has pretty good projected reliability. Yes, even though it does have a CVT. For this generation HRV, Honda really narrowed the pricing window down. It starts at $23,800 and ends at $29,745. That is one of the lowest top end prices in this segment because there are just three ways to get your HRV. And then you choose your color and you choose whether you want all wheel drive or not. That's really all there is to select. We just don't find the same level of variation, the same level of gadgets, features, functions, or more powerful engines that are available in some of the competition. And that's really obvious when you take a look at the pricing range here. The Crosstrek goes up to $31,890, and that's not including the available hybrid because there are essentially three different engines. The base engine, a two and a half liter engine, and then the hybrid. Now for 2024, we don't know exactly how much that Crosstrek is going to cost. I expect it to be really close to the pricing on your screen, but some of those details are going to happen a little bit later because that model is going to go into production the first quarter of 2023. So if you're looking at these prices, this is the old model. If you want to know about the new one, probably add about $1,000 to what you're seeing on your screen. Also a bit of a wild card is the upcoming Corolla Cross Hybrid. We don't have any pricing detail on that. It's probably going to cost around twenty eight dollars to $29,000 starting. So less expensive than a Crosstrek Hybrid because it's not a plug-in hybrid, it's just a regular hybrid. Now we also don't have any visibility on whether or not a Crosstrek Hybrid or plug-in hybrid is going to come back. You can bet that it probably will, but it's probably going to be about a year after we see the all-new Crosstrek. Interesting twist on this list is the Volkswagen Taos, which is, depending on how you look at it, the fourth or the sixth best seller in this segment. That's because the Bronco Sport and the Jeep Compass sell better than the Volkswagen, but they're a lot more expensive than any of these options. They both start basically around $30,000, go on up to $45,000, so they're not quite the same thing as this group of four. The Volkswagen Taos has generally been selling at a bit of a discount, so even though it starts at $24,155, you'll probably be able to get it more like 23,000 or 23,005, at least a little bit of a discount. What makes the Taos interesting is that it does not use a continuously variable transmission, like pretty much everything else in this segment seems to. It has either an 8 speed automatic in the base version with the 1.5 liter turbo, or if you get all wheel drive, then you get a 7 speed dual clutch transmission. So it certainly can have a sharper, more engaging feel. But there are some pros and cons to a dual clutch. However, if you're looking at a front wheel drive vehicle, over 60% of the cars in this segment are sold as front wheel drive. You might want to look at the Taos if you don't like CVTs or if you're just worried about their reliability. The 8-speed automatic is essentially the same ice in 8-speed auto that we find in a wide variety of Toyota vehicles, so the transmission has been pretty reliable. General Taos reliability, though, has been more mid-pack than class-leading. At $34,930, the Taos does end up more expensive in its fully loaded configuration than some of the competition, but that's mainly because of the equipment we find on that top end model. Features like the full LCD instrument cluster, uh, that's really attractive actually in that model, and it's pretty unique in this segment. Also, the dual clutch transmission is generally going to be more expensive than the CVTs that we find in these other alternatives. But comparably equipped, the Volkswagen is going to be pretty similar to the top end trims of most of the competitors that you see on your screen. The one exception there is going to be the Crosstrek, which is really, really affordable. Keep in mind the Crosstrek at $23,645, again for the 2023 model year option, has all-wheel drive standard. So if you're looking for inexpensive all-wheel drive, 
get the base Crosstrek, but know that it's going to be missing a decent number of features versus the HRV. One of the most important features it's going to be missing is an automatic transmission. On the other hand, if you want a manual, it's the only one in this segment that still offers one. So your mileage may vary. Let me know what would you pick if you're shopping in this segment. I have to admit that if I were shopping for a vehicle, I might be willing to pay extra for something like the Ford Bronco Sport. It's not on this list. It is a lot more expensive, but I think it might be worth it. If, however, I was really focused on just these vehicles, I think it would be a really tough call between the Taos and the Corolla Cross. I like the HRV's interior a bit more, but I think the Corolla Cross Hybrid is probably where I would go if I could wait, and I like the combination of roominess and the extra gadgets that we find in the Taos. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section. What would you get if you're looking to spend about twenty-six to twenty-eight thousand dollars, perhaps? Which would you pick and why? Let me know down there. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of those social places. And then you should know that our Facebook name has changed to Auto Buyer's Guide to represent our slow progress towards that new branding. See all of you later.